Hi everyone. In a prior video, we had discussed the three different types of intermolecular force, or IMF, that we see in polar and nonpolar covalent compounds. Now, why is it important to know these different IMFs? Well, because those are the forces that hold molecules in the condensed state. The condensed states, as you know, can be either the solid or liquid state. So the state of a substance, whether it's solid, liquid, or gas, depends on the strength of two opposing forces. The force that holds molecules together, these are the various IMFs that we discuss. They are like the glue that connects molecules together. The strength of this molecular glue depends on the type of IMF you have. Hydrogen bond is the strongest, followed by dipole-dipole, and then London forces. But remember, molecules are not static objects. They can move, and the speed at which they move depends on how much kinetic energy they have. So imagine that your shoe is stuck to the floor that has been smeared with glue all over it, just like shown here. Now, the way you're going to get your shoe off the sticky floor is by pulling it. The stronger you pull, the more likely it is that your shoe will come off the ground. Now, you can see on the left that if you just pull a bit, most of your shoe will still have lots of glue on it. If you pull more, now less glue is stuck because you've managed to break free of some of the glue. If you really pull hard, like the picture on the right, you see that only very little glue is holding your shoe so you can finally break free. This is exactly what's going on when a molecule transitions from solid to liquid to gas. In the solid state, the amount of intermolecular glue or the IMF is much stronger than the molecule's kinetic energy. So most of the molecules are stuck together. As the molecule increases its kinetic energy, it can start to break free from the glue that is the intermolecular force making it a liquid. At high enough kinetic energy, eventually the molecules can escape altogether, making it a gas. The amount of molecular kinetic energy is correlated to the temperature surrounding the molecules. The higher the temperature, the higher the molecule's kinetic energy. As the picture shows here, you can convert a solid to a liquid by adding energy in the form of heat. If you keep heating the substance, that is, if you increase its temperature, eventually it will become a gas. If you reverse the process, that is, you start cooling a substance down or decreasing its temperature, you will convert the gas to liquid and to solid. As you may imagine, the temperature at which a phase change occurs depends on the strength of the IMF. Just like we have glue of different strengths, the intermolecular forces also have different strengths, as we discussed. The type of IMF that holds a molecule together determines the melting and boiling points of the molecule. The weaker the IMF, the easier it is to break. So the melting and boiling points will be lower compared to molecules with stronger IMF. So let's take a look at this question. It says rank the four compounds below from the lowest boiling point to the highest boiling point. So the key idea here to get across is that the weaker the intermolecular force that's holding the molecules together, then the easier it is to break those intermolecular forces and therefore the easier it is to convert the substance to the gas phase. So that means the lower its boiling point point will be. And so the first thing we need to determine is what kind of intermolecular forces we have in each of the substance that's shown here. And to do that, we're going to have to follow the steps that I discussed before, where we draw the Lewis structure, look at the molecular polarity, and then determine the intermolecular force. So the first compound is CH4. I'm just going to draw the Lewis structure right here. Second one is CH3O CH3. And that molecule looks like like this. And again, I'm skipping many of the Lewis structure drawing steps and just come up with the structure right away. But you can work through those and find the same exact answer that I have here. And then the third molecule is that. And then the fourth one is that molecule. Okay, so we have four of these. 
And the first thing is to determine what kind of intermolecular force in each one. So CH4, each of these CH bond is a nonpolar bond if you look at the electronegativity. So as a result, the whole molecule is nonpolar. And because it's nonpolar, then the only type of intermolecular force that exists here is going to be London dispersion forces. So I'm going to write that here, LDF. And then the second molecule has a bunch of nonpolar parts right here. So that's going to be LDF, but there's also a polar component because there is a dipole between carbon and oxygen. So this molecule is a polar molecule, so it's going to have dipole-dipole interaction. We look at the third molecule. It has, again, some nonpolar components here, but then of course it has a dipole with the carbon-oxygen. Also another one with oxygen and hydrogen. Of course, that's a stronger dipole, and that's a hydrogen bond dipole. So this is a polar molecule with hydrogen bond as the main intermolecular force. Last molecule here, everything in here is nonpolar. So as a result, it has also London forces. Now we have two molecules with London forces. So we have to compare which one is a stronger London force. London force is a type of force that depends on the size of the molecule. The larger it is, the molecule, the easier it is to uh, polarize the molecule, making those temporary dipoles stronger. The LDF for this larger molecule is going to be stronger. So we can say here, a stronger LDF. And as a result, once we have that, we can rank the four compounds. The lowest boiling point would be compound A because that one has the weakest IMF. And then that's going to be less than the other LDF molecule, which is C2H6. Then after that, followed by the dipole-dipole molecule, CH3OCH3. And then lastly, we have the hydrogen bond molecule, which is the strongest intermolecular force, therefore the highest boiling point. Okay. We just talked about how we can change the state of a substance by either heating it or cooling it. When we heat a substance, energy is absorbed by the substance. So all the processes going from a more condensed state to a less condensed state are endothermic. Changing a solid to liquid or melting, changing liquid to gas or vaporization, and less commonly changing solid to gas or sublimation are all endothermic processes. On the other hand, if we cool a substance down, we are removing heat away from the substance. So those processes are exothermic. That means freezing, condensation, and deposition, which is the conversion of gas to solid, are all exothermic processes. Recall that we use the term enthalpy to represent the heat of a reaction. Specific phase changes have their own enthalpies. So for example, the heat that is needed to evaporate a specific quantity of liquid is called the liquid's enthalpy of vaporization and has the symbol delta H vaporization. Because this is an endothermic process, the sign of this delta H is positive. The degree symbol next to the delta H indicates the pressure at which the vaporization takes place. There are a few more of these phase changes enthalpies that you will encounter in chemistry. We have the enthalpy of fusion, which refers to the heat needed to melt solid to liquid. The word fusion is used because when a solid melts, the separate pieces fuse together to form a liquid. The enthalpy of fusion also has a positive sign because the process is endothermic. The other two phase change enthalpies are enthalpy of freezing and enthalpy of condensation. The values of these enthalpies are the same as the enthalpy of fusion and vaporization respectively, except that both of these have negative signs in front of them because these processes are exothermic. We can use these phase change enthalpies to calculate how much energy is transferred for a given quantity of substance. All you need to do is multiply the enthalpy of the phase change by the amount of substance you have. Now I want to work through this problem about using the enthalpy of the phase change to calculate the amount of heat that's needed to vaporize a certain amount of water. So as we discussed in the video, all you need to do is multiply the enthalpy of phase change, which is given here, the enthalpy of vaporization is 44 kilojoules per mole of water. And you just multiply that by how much substance you have. Now the substance you're given is water in grams. So the unit of the enthalpy is per mole of water. So you're going to have to do a little conversion here to bring it to moles, which is just using the molar mass of water. 
that's gonna work that out with this as well and so we end up just having 61.1 kilojoules for the amount of heat that's needed to vaporize water now this answer could be given as a delta h in which case this would need a positive symbol or you can just say heat required and put the actual value of the heat